welcome everybody to Grand Morsels. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about this, uh, this program. Uh, we started this as a free virtual series to communicate science concepts. And part of the, uh, the play on the name is that we were trying to take complex scientific ideas and have presenters break those down into sort of bite-sized morsels that make it a little bit more um, uh, digestible or a little bit more um, something we can consume in a smaller sort of fashion. Uh, my name is Richard Beasel. I'll be your moderator for today. And so um, I'm going to ask that you hold questions until the very end. Um, right now, the chat function is just to chat the, the host or the co-host and um, tech support. So Kathy can see your texts uh, if you did want to put something into chat there. But for now, I'm going to ask that you hold questions until the end. I'll open the chat back up at that time, and then you can pose your questions there, and we can um, have a chance to ask questions to our presenter. Uh, I just want to say one or two things real quickly about um, the Regional Math and Science Center. So um, Chris Packle was unable to be here tonight, so I'll be um, acting as moderator in his place. Uh, the idea of Grand Morsels was proposed to be kind of a pilot program where we have um, four speakers lined up and to see how things go. And so we welcome your feedback. I believe um, after the presentation, you'll get an email that, um, with a link that will kind of allow you to provide some feedback and help us improve it as we move forward. And um, with that in mind, um, let me just go ahead and uh, introduce session number two, Human Impacts on the Environment, the View from Archaeology and the Past. And our presenter today is Dr. Elizabeth Arnold who is an environmental archaeologist in the GVSU Department of Anthropology. So Dr. Arnold, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me here today and uh, letting me be part of Grand Morsels. I like to uh, jump on a, any train that is wanting to talk science with the, um, the public out of Grand Valley State. Um, and I like to particularly do it um, coming from the place of archaeology. Um, oftentimes when people think about sciences, they're thinking about biology and chemistry, and I want to jump up and down and say archaeology is a science too. Um, and so I always try to make sure that I'm part of this and I am an environmental archaeologist so I draw on ecology and biology um, uh, sciences like that uh, quite strongly. My training is actually in archaeological chemistry. I started out as a chemistry major. Um, so I sort of wrap all those things up into um, an archaeological framework. And I most like to talk about um, humans in the environment. So if I were to start us out with some definitions and talk about what we're talking about, and everybody has an idea of what archaeology is about, it, it looks like this, right? This is actually a Grand Valley student excavating um, at, our, at the site that I work on in Israel at Tel Asefi. And really archaeology is, is about studying human activity in the past. I am not going to be talking about dinosaurs because I am not a paleontologist. I'm interested in what humans were doing in the past. And I would take that definition in a slightly more specific way and that I say archaeology is the study of human behavior in the past. And so if you watch archaeology um, in the movies and on television, everybody seems quite um, keen to put beautiful pieces on a shelf in a museum. And really, that's not what archaeology, modern archaeology is about. We're really interested in understanding human behavior um, in the past. So, you know, what, how people were growing food, what um, choices were they making in terms of what they were eating, what plants they were um, exploiting, what animals they were exploiting, how were they exploiting those animals? So those are all the kind of questions that I like to ask about human behavior in the past. And so if I were to talk about environmental archaeologists very specifically, I would say, well, we use, you know, the various techniques from the earth sciences and the biological sciences to study these relationships between people and their environments. Now, biologists and botanists and ecologists and geologists do all of this in the modern world, and I simply do it in the ancient world. So um, I've worked in uh, many different time periods and in many different countries. And so when I am talking about working in South Africa, um, I think of my sites as quite new in that they are only, a, um, they date to about 1000 AD or 1000 CE, um, whereas the site I work in in Israel dates all the way back to um, 3500 BC or BCE. So um, lots of different varying um, moments in the past. And archaeology is quite good at borrowing, borrowing, 
techniques from biology and ecology uh, to apply them to questions of the past. And sometimes we do that very well. And sometimes we perhaps uh, need to be a little bit more cognizant of how those techniques are um, applying. Kathy, your very cute puppy was distracting me. <laughs> so um, you can think about the, there's lots of different things that environmental archeologists do. And um, we can look at plant remains, we can look at animal remains, we can look at the soils and the sediments to try to document past environments. And so my particular interest is animal bone material. And so this picture on the left is perhaps one of my favorite things uh, to do and talk about. This is actually a photo I took in the field of bones that I was about to sit down and analyze. Um, and when I look at it, I immediately see that there are sheep and goat in that box. And so I know that I'm gonna be talking about domestic animals. I have done some plant analysis in the past and plant analysis is really interesting because we can go from the very obvious plant remains like seeds and pieces of wood uh, to very microscopic um, parts of plants that we can use to reconstruct the environment. And because we're archaeologists, we always have to think about the soils and sediment that um, our archaeological material is found in, and that actually can tell us quite a bit about the environment as well. So environmental archaeology is always very interdisciplinary in that we are always talking with various experts, whether they are ecologists, biologists, geologists, we all very much work together. So when we think about the human relationship with our environment, it's certainly uh, the environment dictates how we live. Um, Kathy mentioned, you know, we might, uh, if we were in person, we might all be stuck driving on ice. And so certainly in Michigan, we know that weather can uh, definitely impact um, our behavior. But our interaction with the environment is also very culturally determined. It's not just about the natural environment. There's this cultural human component to it. And so if I were to define culture, culture is one of these words that we use quite regularly, but what, what do we really mean when we're talking about it? Well, I can define culture as the learned behaviors of a particular group of people. So we learn our culture, we learn our language, we learn appropriate modes of behavior, various rituals and traditions. And we, I use the definition here of practice by a particular group of people because we could perhaps talk about American culture. I am a dual citizen, so I'm both an American citizen and a Canadian citizen. And I can tell you very clearly that Canadian and American culture do differ, but we can also talk about a particular group of people on perhaps a slightly different scale. I can talk about the Laker culture at Grand Valley, for example, right? So what group of people we're talking about can be quite um, variable. So we have to think about that complexity that comes from our cultural interactions as well. Now, this photo is perhaps um, telling <laughs> today um, or over the next few days, but we have to think of the very wide range of environments that humans live in. So if we were talking about giraffes, for example, or hippopotami, they um, have a much more restricted range. And, but humans, we've pretty much expanded into every environment on earth. And um, a colleague of mine actually talks about um, anthropology in space. So as we um, potentially explore other planets, um, archaeology could even expand even further into thinking about our environments. I stole this picture um, and the because um, I found it really interesting to our topic. This is from The Ecologist only a couple of years ago, and the title was Humans Trashing the Environment for 4,000 Years. And I thought, well, that's a really uh, perhaps pessimistic view of our relationship with the environment. But as we think about our various environmental um, crises today uh, that are perhaps becoming more and more um, evident to us, we do have to think about our relationship with the environment in the past. And 4,000 years, I would expand this even further into the past, is that humans, pretty much since we've been around, have been impacting our environment um, in various ways. You can think of us trampling vegetation when we consume food and leave our waste behind. We're changing soil chemistry, right? Using fertilizers and pesticides in our modern society will change soil chemistry. Campfires, we certainly had our um, share of uh, forest fires last year. You know, what animals are we hunting? What kind of impacts are we having on prey? Fishing, game weirs, right? We move plants and animals around to new environments. Uh, my parents live in Australia and rabbits were introduced into Australia 
um, because some colonialist wanted to be able to hunt something and now Australia is overrun with rabbits because they have no natural predator. I mean, we have had some pretty serious impacts. And so as a zooarchaeologist, somebody who wants to study animal bones in the archeological record, I might start us here with um, domesticating animals. And so dogs were our first animal to be domesticated. And there's probably a variety of reasons for that in that dogs probably learned pretty quickly to hang out with human groups meant that they were able to scavenge and forage food. And humans were perhaps able to domesticate animal or domesticate dogs quite readily because the social structure within an within a wolf pack um, is very amenable to humans stepping in. We all know um, about the alpha wolf is considered to be the lead animal in the pack. And when humans domesticated dogs, we were able to step into that role of being alpha within a group of dogs. So we domesticated dogs, but they perhaps domesticated us as well. Um, once we were wolves and wild and wary, and then we noticed you had so us. So, um, you know, it's a mutual relationship now. So um, dog domestication is particularly interesting because it probably happened in multiple places. Um, and we can talk about other domestic animals doing that as well. Certainly um, cattle were domesticated in a few places as well. So it's a quite global phenomena, um, many different cultures and independent uh, domestication. And we think about domesticated animals as really only looking at the successful ones. So we can recognize sheep and goat as having been domestic animals. But if we look at perhaps some of the antelopes in Africa, for example, these are not domesticated animals. And so did we try to domesticate them in the past? Were they not amenable to that? There's various factors going on, but we can still talk about clear domestic versus wild animal species. We think about plants in our environment. The easiest way to, to, to utilize plants is to simply go around and um, consume them or collect them until there's nothing else there. And then you move to a new area. And for most of our human history, people were hunters and gatherers. And it's only once we reach um, agriculture that we become dependent on growing our own food. And there's a great article out there that talks about, well, why did some groups not shift to agriculture? And uh, Kalahari um, San says, well, why would I do that? Why would I work so hard to grow my own food when there are so many mongongo nuts in the world and that it's simply easier for me to go around and collect this? But there are various things that sort of pushed us into agriculture and really changed our relationship with the environment, particularly in how we gathered plants and um, how we gathered food, how we uh, utilize plants and animals. And we tend to think of agriculture as being a grand idea that somebody had at some point, but as studies have shown us, the hunter-gatherers had it much better than us and that they worked a lot less. And so there were probably various climatic changes that started to change the distribution of the various plants and animal resources that hunter-gatherers were relying on. And so in order to try to maintain their lifestyle, they started to make very small shifts in their behavior that sort of gradually took us towards domestication, manipulating the plants that we were interested in. If I had a patch of barley or wheat, wild uh, wheat or barley that I was interested in um, exploiting and consuming, I might say, oh, and there's been not quite as much production here as there was last year. I might take away some of these other plants that in order to let the wheat grow. And so I've weeded, but I haven't become an agriculturalist. But you can imagine that over many generations, that kind of behavior would eventually take us um, in the direction of agriculture. And with plants, we have the um, quandary of, for me as an animal bone specialist, animal bones survive pretty well in the archeological record and has certainly impacted about how archeologists have talked about subsistence patterns and our food patterns. Because bone survives very well and because the stone tools that um, men would have used for hunting animals survive very well in the archeological record. There has been this bias about talking about man the hunter. When in and uh, now in studying hunter-gatherer communities, we know that it's actually the gatherers, the women, that produce probably about 80% of the calories of the diet. 
but because the plants themselves don't survive in the archaeological record as well as bones do. And the tools that women would have used for gathering, like baskets or digging sticks, don't survive as well in the archaeological record. Women the gatherer were a little bit more invisible to us as archaeologists. And that has changed over the years as the theoretical paradigms have changed and whatnot, and even out, but there's um, still this bias in the archaeological record. So when we think about the origins of agriculture, it's this big shift in how we um, interact with our environment. It's often been called, archeologists like to call it, the Neolithic revolution. And the word revolution um, certainly indicates what a big change it was for how we interact with the environment. But I wanna be a little bit critical here because it also implies that the uh, change was quite quick, right? Revolutions tend to happen and there's this major shift in society and culture and things are different. Well, the Neolithic revolution or the origins of agriculture were probably quite um, slow, as I talked about these varying decisions, very small decisions over generations. And this is perhaps particularly well illustrated in um, looking at corn. So the wild ancestor of corn is identified here on the left as Teosinte. And it's a grass that grows wild in Mesoamerica. And you can perhaps recognize corn or maize on the right. And you will see that those two plants look very different. And so we're talking about a very slow process of change and domestication as people made choices about characteristics of plants and animals that they wanted to exploit. Um, so when we think about what environmental archaeologists are looking at, I gave this definition before, using the techniques of earth and biological science to study the relationships among people and their environments. And we use both organic evidence and inorganic evidence. And so what we don't often find is the organic evidence, as I mentioned, cloth, wood, leather, basketry, all of these things that simply don't survive very well in the archaeological record. And what we do, oh, and I love this photo. Um, this was from uh, field work in Sudan that was um, speaking with people about food production in a field that we call ethnoarchaeology. So in hoping to help me interpret some of the archaeological residues of food production, I spoke with people who were currently still you know, making food in a traditional manner. So this is the gentleman at the bakery and he's making the delicious bread. Um, and as we look at the tray of bread that he's busy preparing for the oven, um, and the tools that he's using, what we would find in the archaeological record is really only the, the oven. And so the paddle and the basketry and all of those things that he would have used to produce the bread, we don't see. And so we have to be cognizant of that sort of gap in the record when we're trying to uh, make interpretations. What we do see is the bone, the pottery, the stone tools, right? And so we have to be... Um, careful about what kind of interpretations we're making when we don't have all the evidence. Depending on the conditions that we have, sometimes we luck out and we um, have some extraordinary conditions that might preserve our organic material very, very well. So very dry environments are particularly good for um, organic preservation. And so when we think about ancient Egypt, and um, ancient Egypt is perhaps most famous for mummification of human remains, that started as a natural process that Egyptians then modified and built on. Because it's a very dry environment, um, bodies would have naturally mummified. We have great organic preservation from the American Southwest for the same reason. You might be familiar with um, the phenomena of bog bodies. And you can see that this gentleman is particularly well preserved um, because he was buried in a very wet environment and in, importantly, an anaerobic environment. So uh, no oxygen in order to um, decay. And so preservation of skin, et cetera, incredible here. In fact, so incredible that you can still even see the rope around his neck um, that it was the cause of his death. This is actually a sacrificial um, victim from the bog bodies. And then we can have very cold environments that are good for preservation. So um, I like this picture of the Andy, um, mountains in the Andes. Again, we have natural mum mummies from the high Andes um, that are very well preserved because of that very cold environment. So 
when I say all of those things about what is and is not likely to be found in the archaeological record, you think, well, that's pretty biased and it's like pretty incomplete. And it's like, yes, it absolutely is, right? Most of what we find in the archaeological record is what I like to call other people's garbage. It's stuff that we threw away and abandoned and accidentally lost and, you know, was uh, preserved by a freak accident and freak um, conditions and oftentimes damaged by later development. Um, every time you put a shovel in the ground in modern day London, you're going to find something archaeological, it seems. Um, so that's the kind of evidence we have, and we have to be um, aware of it. And we have to in, um, adapt our methods in order to be aware of that bias in the record, and also be careful about how we are conducting our archaeological excavations to make sure we're um, dealing with that bias. So if we think about the various divisions of environmental archaeology, I could break this down into the hard sciences, earth sciences in terms of geology, and we can talk about archaeobotany uh, or paleobotany, looking at ancient plants in the archaeological record. Zooarchaeology, my favorite, where we study um, the animal bones. And I would also include bioarchaeology, which is a specific focus on human remains, which can all give us varying um, pieces of information about our um, ancient environments. So when we think about um, the geological factors, right? These are largely non-cultural aspects of site, but of sites, but still important to us thinking about the environment, right? And a couple of colleagues of mine are geoarchaeologists, and they think sort of much bigger picture than what I do in terms of site analysis, right? They're thinking about the major land masses, volcanic activity, where earthquakes happen, right? And all of those physical and chemical um, characteristics of soils that can influence human behavior. So I actually do very little geoarchaeology work, but I have done a little in that the area in South Africa where I work, um, you can see these beautiful cattle in the left um, picture. And in the culture that I was looking at, the um, cattle are a form of wealth. And so the more cattle you have, the more important you are, the more social power you have in society. And one of the organizations of sites then was to keep animals penned together in a particular um, area. And so to try to identify those areas of where cattle were kept, we actually did some soil analysis. And by looking for high levels of um, phosphorus, that tells us where the dung or where the that tells us where the dung was, where the animals were kept, and allowed us to identify various components of sites. What's more usual um, and a technique that many archaeologists use, not just geoarchaeologists, is looking at um, various geochemical um, survey techniques in order to try to identify where we should dig. Archaeology is quite expensive in terms of time and in terms of effort. And so we want to make sure that our, where we're digging, we're making the most of our time. So in 2001, here you can see our students out you can tell it's kind of a cold day, right? It was early May, kind of a cold day out and they are they have the magnetometer out. And so they're simply gonna walk across this very large field, um, taking readings with the equipment as they go. And that will help us determine where um, uh, architectural um, remains might be, um, areas of greater density. And so we might think, oh, there's, there's an occupation there and that'll help us narrow it down. We also, same uh, field school, did ground penetrating radar. You can see the equipment looks slightly different. Um, we use both of these techniques to survey this very large field in order to target where we would put our excavation unit. So using some geological survey techniques there um, quite readily. When we look at plant remains, depends what we're talking about. Um, seeds survive well in the archaeological record if they're charred, if they've been burnt. Um, and so we can get plant remains, but not every plant gets um, prepared where it would be near fire. Um, as with my Irish background, potatoes don't survive very well in the archaeological record, but corn does, right? And it tells us a very different picture. Um, and so we can look at plants to tell us specifically about some of the environmental um, aspects we might be interested in. Because plants have particular niches, particular conditions of temperature and precipitation where they're gonna flourish 
we can say, well, if this plant is here, this is what the environment had to look like. If we have dry adapted plants, then we're looking at a dry environment. If we have aquatic plants, we're looking in aquatic environment. And like I say, we might be using seeds and wood to help us determine, we might, the picture in the middle is an image of pollen grains, which is perhaps the first um, um, element of plants that were used to reconstruct in the archeological record. And this one on the right are actually phytoliths, which are tiny silica bodies that plants will produce that help us um, identify what species of plant there. Uh, phytoliths have been quite useful in identifying corn in the archeological record as a major um, food crop. And so um, don't get freaked out, I won't quiz you on this, but this is the kind of thing that pollen grains um, tell us. And so we can see you know, what trees were present, what aquatic plants were present. And you can see how this kind of information on a very broad scale can give us a reconstruction of the environment that humans were living in. Um, this is a, a news article, I, uh, shameless self-promotion that I clipped right from our um, excavation at Tel Asefi, which is the hometown of Goliath. Um, we had several um, archaeological uh, research chemists right in the field with us, um, taking very specific um, probes for plant remains and whatnot in order to help us um, reconstruct the environment. Um, and so here's my favorite um, animal bones from the archaeological record. And, you know, this is kind of what you think of when you think about eating animals, right? Um, we have... I'm thinking of the Arby's commercial. We have the meats. Well, I don't have the meats. I have the bone, right? And this is usually what I have to analyze. And so it's very fragmented. I don't usually have complete skeletons. And this is what I'm faced with identifying. However, I do have this. This is perhaps, people always ask me, oh, you're an archaeologist. What's the coolest thing you've ever found? This, this is the coolest thing I've ever found. Um, in that this is our site in Israel, and we actually have five of these ladies. They are all female, five-year-old donkeys, and they are all fully complete. They are not butchered, and they are buried under the house floors. And so you might think, why would anyone want to bury a donkey under their house floor? Well, the current interpretation we have for this region is that, or this area of the city, is that this was a neighborhood of merchants and traders. And so you can imagine the importance of donkeys as beasts of burden to traders. And so that's like, okay, I understand that importance, but then why would you have them buried under your house floor? Um, and so we actually think that this is a marker of just how um, wealthy and important um, these animals were to the archeological record. Incidentally, this is a great photo, but the preservation of bone at the site is actually terrible. So this is the only time the bones are intact. Once we start taking them out of the ground, they literally fall apart in our hands. It's quite depressing. I actually painted one of the skeletons with glue in order to um, try to consolidate some of the bone. It was a very arts and crafts day in the field. Um, was not particularly successful though. Um, so wild and domestic, um, I particularly like the contrast between wild boar and domestic pigs, uh, particularly now that we think of uh, pigs oftentimes as pets, right? I've uh, been on my husband to think about a pot belly pig um, as a pet. He is very much against this idea. Um, and animals bring all kinds of things to us, right? They certainly bring us companionship if we're thinking about our pets but they can also bring us disease um, when we live in close proximity to them. We can think about all of the various ways that um, cooking and our food um, preparation methods reflect our cultural preferences, whether we're boiling, whether we're roasting, whether we're drying, and what kind of animals we're consuming. Um, right, I work in Israel, so clearly I don't eat any bacon double cheeseburgers when I'm in the field. Um, but I am also um, raised in the Catholic tradition, so I don't keep kosher when I'm at home, but these are very evident cultural taboos about food avoidance that we're um, well aware of. So all of these things that we can start to um, reconstruct from the record that we find in the archaeology. Um, and I will... Um, I highlight these guys, reptiles, perhaps rodent bones, some fish. Well, we might be eating fish, um, rodents and reptiles, oh, maybe not, depends on the culture. 
But these little guys that we um, can find in the archaeological record, if we're careful enough to collect them and look for them, can tell us often, again, about environmental conditions, right? Rodents like to hang out with us for the same reason that dogs do, lots of food morsels to be found. But rodents also tend to have a very specific niche of conditions in terms of temperature that they like to, um, to live in. And so they can give us quite detailed um, environmental reconstructions as well. And the same can be said of reptiles. So the final thing that I will end with is of course thinking about humans as another animal. Um, I have a colleague who is a bioarchaeology um, specialist and so is really looking at the various elements of reconstructing diet, reconstructing health, um, again, disease and pathology from human remains as well. So I think that takes me right to the end, almost perfectly on time. Yes. Um, and I am more than happy to uh, open the floor to questions and answer any bits and pieces you might have. Great. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. So um, I believe I opened up the chat. So if you wanted to type questions, if you had any questions for Dr. Arnold, um, we'll try to monitor that and um, I'll try to um, um, relay that to her. If it will give you a few minutes to kind of form those thoughts there. I believe it should be available to you now if you wanted to type your questions into chat. Um, maybe to kind of get us started while people are kind of putting their thoughts out there. Um, Dr. Arnold, um, are there any instances of where a new discovery took place that changed the way we thought about something, um, like kind of fundamentally altered it, or maybe for you changed the way we thought about previous human behavior where this particular site was so important that it change the way we, we perceive what happened in, in the past for humans? Is there well, something I, that kind of stands out to you? So there's two that stand out for me. One that is very much in the big scale of archaeology in that um, there's a site in South America known as Monte Verde, which is well down in South America, yet dates very, very early, 23,000 years ago. And at the time that those dates came out from that site, we just they were completely against the understanding of how people came into the new world, right? We are perhaps familiar with the idea that people came over the Bering Land Bridge and then expanded down through North America and into South America over many centuries, millennia. And the dates that you know were sort of suggested for that coming over the bridge were about 12,000 um, years ago. And so the dates at Monte Verde, well down in South America, just sort of threw that out is like, how can these dates be reasonable? People hadn't even entered the new world at that time. And so that really threw um, a big wrench into our current understanding of how people um, came into the new world. It's, you know, and then at first it was like, these dates are clearly incorrect. Um, they're now accepted and have been supported by many other sites as well. And so we would think of the peopling of the new world happening as early as 30,000 years ago. So really almost tripling um, the time frame that we were previously thinking about that. So that was a really big um, upset. Um, the one I think about sort of on a more personal level is the photo I showed you of the two individuals taking samples at SAFI. One of the things that was done is that we find a lot of olive pits. Um, carbonized olive pits in the site. And um, Elisabetta, who's the uh, woman in that photo, um, started doing radiocarbon dates on the olive pits. Now, traditionally, radiocarbon dates have been done on wood. And so a tree might represent, you know, several generations. How old can trees be? You know, they can be up to centuries years old. Where olive pits are produced in a season. And so by dating the olive pits, they were able to significantly refine the chronology of the periods that we're looking at. And it actually shifted things by about almost 1500 years um, in terms of our understanding. And it was particularly interesting for me as an environmental archeologist because traditionally we've said, oh, well, we see this period when cities kind of fall into neglect and decline and many people move out of cities and expand into the landscape. And they do that because of environmental change. And with this new revision of the chronology based on the olive pits, when we see the decline of cities and when we see the environmental change no longer match up. And so we're like, wow, now we need a whole new explanation to um, think about this major um, shift in how people were living in the landscape. So I thought that was kind of interesting as well. Mm -hmm. 
Thank, thank you for sharing that and some of the, the thoughts you had about those, those the two interesting things. Um, we do have some questions in the chat. So Sarah is asking, do you ever imagine what future environmental archaeologists will find most interesting about our current culture here in Michigan or more broadly in the U.S.? Oh, good question. Um, I think what's going to be really, okay, now it depends on what kind of time scale we're thinking about. But if I think of like several millennia from now, I think one of the most interesting and perhaps complex things that um, archaeologists might have to deal with in, um, in many cities, not just North America, is just how multicultural we could be, we can be in terms of our food, right? So we can certainly define American food. But if you look at downtown Grand Rapids, for example, there are Indian restaurants and there are Mexican restaurants and there are, um, I think there's even a tiki bar downtown still, right? And so when you look at all of those sort of um, amalgamations of different cultural traditions, I think that might be um, particularly complex to try to tease apart when we think of our more globalized um, world as cultures have come together in recent, um, in recent years. Okay. Uh, we have a second question. Mary Ruth is kind of wondering about maybe a different kind of audience. Um, what would you recommend as maybe a specific case study that might grab a young teen's attention and spark their imagination? Does something come to mind right away for you? Actually, something does come to mind right away. I would, and I think that, I think my kids, um, you know, get, get all of this at them all the time. Um, and I think they might have actually got my, my kids are 14 and 10. And so I think at least one of them might have been introduced to this at um, in school, in middle school, uh, maybe even in elementary, but um, the case of Bootsy the Iceman, who was discovered in Austria, and actually we fought over where he was supposed to be um, located, but that's a really amazing archaeological discovery um, because he's 9,000 years old. When the body was first discovered, people just assumed that he was a hiker that had met an unfortunate end, uh, but when his body was removed, they realized, oh, wait a minute, he had stone, he had spear points and arrows that were made out of stone tools. He has a copper ax and a flint knife. And his clothing are, is made of um, uh, grasses and he has shoes on that are made of like leather and grasses. And so he's a really amazing discovery because A, he's so old, um, but because he was caught in the ice, he's an amazing case of preservation, both in terms of his own physical body, but of the um, various um, artifacts that he has with him. And so it's very um, interesting because we get just this incredible like snapshot of his life. And there's a variety of, so I have the children's book. <laughs> Let's see, the Iceman has been uh, presented to sort of a more elementary audience, and then there are more um, sort of higher level um, adult books on Let's see, the Iceman. There's several films as well. I think Nova has done um, a couple of specials, and there was sort of this um, bunch of research done on him, attention to him when he was first discovered. And then in the last sort of, you know, about 10 or 15 years later, there's sort of this second burst of research on him as they applied some of the new um, archeological techniques and studies that, uh, that were allowed because archeology span as a discipline tends to be pretty destructive. And even you know, the kinds of analysis that we do tends to uh, destroy material. And so when you have a really unique discovery like Butzi, um, it's very, and people don't want to, you know, sacrifice even a small piece of him um, for science, which is, you know, I get that. Um, and a lot of the new techniques that are coming out use much, much less um, material and so can be applied to some of those more unique, um, unique finds and unique studies. And so there's sort of like several decades of research on Utsi. I want, I can't quite remember off the top of my head when his body was discovered, but he's a really interesting case study and you can get into him uh, you can get interested in him, you know, on his, um, on the recovery of his body, but also with all of the artifacts that he has um, with him. So he's sort of a mummy and a uh, uh, cache of archaeological artifacts as well. Great. And um, I see Kathy put a, a little bit of a positive comment there about being intrigued by your topic and then what you're talking about. And um, I think we've got time for a, a one more question here. Um, Sarah, wrote, uh, do you have any examples of domestications of animals that are not fully developed yet or partially developed? 
So um, we think of, you know, perhaps um, obvious domestics, sheep and goat, um, cattle, pigs, right? Easy, clear domestic animals. Um, but I'm pretty, you know, you drive around Michigan and you can find, you know, you will see um, deer or elk farms and you will see bison um, farms as well. Those bison and elk, for example, are maybe on their way to domestication, but we wouldn't necessarily call them domestic yet. Um, and so, and you can, so those would be my two best examples. Um, you know, when we think the definition of domestication in biology and in archeology span um, can sometimes be different because, you know, our definition of a, um, a species, for example, is can produce fertile offspring. Well, for archaeologists, we don't, we can't know that when we're looking just at bones. So um, I think we would still consider elk and bison as wild, but perhaps it's clearly on their way to being domesticated because of how we're exploiting them. We've also in the past, I don't know if we still do this, but um, ostrich and elk have been, ostrich and emu, I was thinking of the Australian example, ostrich and emu have also been farmed. I don't think we'd call either of those domesticated um, yet. So that, but that pattern of starting to control animals' movement, starting to control their breeding patterns, that's how we move down the road to domestication. So anything that we're starting to keep in a pen is uh, definitely um, a possibility. Great, thank you so much. Um, and so I, I just wanna make a, a few quick sort of comments here. We're getting close to the end of our time, I believe. Um, Kathy put a link into the chat. So um, keeping up with Grand Morsels, if you wanna attend our third um, session, please feel free to do that. You can register to get the Zoom link. It's, for, it's March 29th, Why Fish Don't Freeze, How Soap Works and More, The Amazing Chemistry of Water. So if you wanted to get the Zoom link, check that out. Dr. Arnold's presentation, we were recording this. And so that'll get posted next to the um, first session that we had um, last month. So again, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Dr. Arnold for coming in and giving us that presentation. So um, definitely register for the next one and um, hopefully I will see you there. Thank you so much, everybody. Have Thanks a good night. Thanks for coming. <laughs>